begin the proceedings of the session first with the presentation on FIKI EY Knowledge Report 2023, for which I have the privilege in inviting Dr. Avantika Tomar, partner EY Parthenon. Let's put hands together to welcome ma'am. Thank you so much um, for inviting me. Uh, esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've lost the students post the tea break, but hopefully they will come back. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Fiki, and uh, as always, very, very, very proud and privileged um, that EY Parthenon is yet again the knowledge partner for this report. Uh, what I thought I might do in the 10 minutes or so that we have, uh, if we could please have the slides up as well. Um, is just give you a sense of the report, uh, what it contains, uh, what are some of the key messages, what are the, some of the key uh, aspects that we are highlighting with respect to uh, higher education in India. Um, look, usually by the time I come into these conferences uh, uh, and, and make a speech like this, there's a lot of talk that has already gone in speaking about how great higher education in India is. Today, this morning, and, and therefore I end up being the bearer of bad news and say, guys, well done, everybody's celebrating how large we are, how big we are, but we could have been a lot more, we should have been a lot more, right? Um, I'm, I'm very pleased personally that this year in the inaugural session itself, um, thanks to Shailesh, thanks to um, you know the CEO of Niti Aayog, I think there's been a lot of sobering messages that have been communicated already. So I will not, therefore, continue to be a bearer of the bad news. I will hopefully try and give you a sense of bit of both, things that are working well in higher education in India, and things that certainly um, should improve. And it's absolutely imperative that people in this room um, take it upon themselves, whether they are higher education institutes, whether they are government officials and policy makers, or they are people like myself who are you know, representing industry in a group like this. So um, let, us, um, let us talk about the report. And again, please feel free to um, you know, find the report on ey.com. If you don't, please do reach out to us, reach out to me. I'd be very happy to share the specifics of not just what the report is, but also what the research uh, that goes behind the report is. Um, there are four themes, sorry, Atul, if you're around, can I have the slides up, please? Um, there are four themes that we have particularly spoken about in this report. And as a reminder to some people who probably remember the report from last year, um, it was heartening to see a few people with copies of the last year's report. Um, last year, we spoke about how should India look like from a higher education standpoint in 2047, right? So we laid out, as Fiki and EY Parthenon together, we laid out five five-year plans to say, if every five years we do what we are expected to do from an industry standpoint, higher education standpoint, as well as government policy maker standpoint, we will get there in 2047, which is the 100th year of um, us being independent. This year, however, we just thought, look, that is way out in the future, right? Uh, that is about five five-year plans. Can we? think a little bit closer in time, and therefore give universities, policymakers, and industries a very quick one to three years, so 12 to 36 month action plan, right? To say, if we are to achieve the greatness that we are, um, yeah, thank you so much, um, the greatness that we wish to achieve by 2047, we've got to start somewhere. And that start has to be credible. That start has to be solid. Um, therefore, this year, we put out these four themes and we said, look, we absolutely need to lay the bedrock, have the right foundation across these four themes. First one, and I'll just go into a little bit of detail across the, across the four, and perhaps, like I said, sometimes my job as a consultant is to call a spade a spade. So let me, across these four themes, uh, also start telling you what's not working at the moment. First one being quality um, education. There are four subparts to it, and I think the speakers before me in the morning inaugural session have very kindly spoken about all four, right? There is faculty. I mean, I was just talking to someone outside. You can't have the right students with the right skills, which 
is the focus if the faculty themselves do not have those skills, right? How do we bring those skills into the system? One, with high quality PhD programs. Two, with high quality um, industry alignment even for the faculty. There's a lot of emphasis typically to say, can students go outside, get industry skills and come back, right? Why not have the same yardstick of uh, measuring quality for faculty as well, right? So that exchange needs to be both ways. Um, professors of practice, so industry practitioners coming into universities and teaching real world practical skills which pretty much everyone in the morning session spoke about, but also the other way around where uh, academics, faculty, uh, people who are very deep, very strong in knowledge, perhaps need to balance that strength in knowledge with a little bit of skills, also go outside. Um, there's obviously digital and, and technology and the advent of technology in education as a sector. I mean, um, you know, COVID has remarkably changed all of that, our acceptance to technology, our belief in technology, and the fact that we can actually upskill ourselves using digital and online platforms. NEP has very nicely put out that 20 to 40% of all um, degree programs can and should be done in an online world, right? In an online fashion, through online certification programs, courses, degrees, etc. cetera. Um, that said, the penetration of online learning programs at the moment is not where it needs to be. Um, internationalization, again, I won't belabor the point too much, but today we send a lot of undergrad and postgrad students from India to overseas, namely, you know, US, UK, Canada, Australia. If there's one thing that we learned from Russia, Ukraine war was that, um, you know, we had 20,000 Indian students doing medicine in Ukraine at the time, right? Same with Israel. The first ones that very quickly we understood um, uh, who's, which Indians are getting impacted, it was actually the students who were studying in these uh, war-torn countries. Why is it that we have so many students going overseas but nearly not an equal proportion coming back, right? There's only 50,000 students who come from Africa, Southeast Asia, Middle East, et cetera, into India. Uh, but we do send, I know uh, Mr. Subramanian spoke of a number of 13 lakhs, right? So we send that many students overseas, but we actually get only 50,000 50, students back. The story on the faculty side is even worse, right? We don't get nearly enough faculty members who would want to at least spend a year, two years in India, you know, having that exchange program with us. Um, and then finally, um, academic flexibility. I think again, uh, some of the speakers before me have spoken about, we don't have the culture of, can a student pause their degree, go out, work and come back, and that work will actually amount to credit um, in, their, in their degree program. We don't have that. Uh, we don't recognize past learning nearly well um, or nearly in comparison to what the developed world does. So those are some of the aspects of the themes um, in, in quality education. Industry alignment, look, I think skilling, and, and um, I think Ashutosh from LinkedIn said this, and I absolutely agree, potential over pedigree, right? What is the point of having a fa fancy degree uh, when you don't have the skills to execute in the real workplace, right? So there's definitely the, the, the um, you know, emphasis on skilling continues to be really important, and that is only going to happen, like I said, when um, faculty and higher education institutes, along with industry, so I'm as much a part of this, uh, along with industry actually start to contribute. Um, collaborations, again, not just from a course curriculum standpoint, and later in the session we'll, we'll talk about it, um, SDG goals is important uh, and therefore curriculum needs to be revised, but also can industry start participating in the research, right? Um, the stats suggest that uh, just about 41% of the gross um, uh, expenditure in R&D comes from industry in India. That number for a Japan or a US is in the late 70s, for a Korea is in the late 80s, right? And we are at roughly 40%. Um, Research and innovation, so continuing on from that theme of we don't have enough emphasis on research, and I think Vidya started the session with that this morning. Um, as a country, we spend 0.7% of our GDP on research of any type, whether it's STEM-related or non-STEM, right? That number for developed world is 35 to 4%, roughly there. So we are not even in the same league when it comes to our focus and emphasis on R&D. 
and then finally inclusivity and i was i was fascinated by the fact that actually none of our speakers uh, in the morning session emphasized that aspect um, um, uh, at all in fact right um, look inclusivity we felt as evi parsonon when we were doing this research we felt it's quite important to uh, not just create an environment where there is great education, great industry alignment, and, and awesome research. It's also equally important to think through that in that demographic dividend that we all speak about, we are taking everyone with us on the journey, right? So I think um, uh, Mr. Subramanian spoke about can the demographic dividend one day become a demographic burden, right? Uh, it won't if we keep inclusivity in mind. Right. So we can't be doing the first three pillars in the absence of the fourth one. And here, you know, we are talking about a broader definition of inclusivity. Of course, gender is an important one. Um, we actually, you know, delve deeper. I've got my colleagues here from my team. We delve deeper into not just student ratios um, for male-female, but what is that male-female ratio or gender ratio for faculty? And actually, the number is not impressive at all. You go further up to the vice chancellor level, that number drops even below, right? So faculty is about 20, 25%. You look at female vice chancellors in the country, that number drops to single digits, right? So it's how are we ever going to talk about um, diversity in the student population if we are not leading from the front, right? If we are not role modeling that, whether it's gender or sexual orientation, so LGBTQIA, or um, uh, students with physical disability, if we don't actually role model across all of those themes, inclusivity at a faculty and a leadership level, I'm not sure we'll be able to do it at a student population level. So therefore, um, if we could skip through to page four, um, so next, next, please. Uh, therefore, what, right? Uh, again, uh, I'm, I've spoken about the next one, please, Atul, thank you. Um, if we therefore talk about what are we supposed to do, sorry, next slide, whoever's got control. Uh, here's what we are supposed to do, right? And um, in true consulting style, we have broken this down by stakeholders, right? Because it's not going to be a one size fits all and not everyone's supposed to do everything, right? So let's, let's look at, uh, you know, what a higher education institute is supposed to do, right? And that's, that's the first column here that you see. Across the four themes, and those themes are in the blue boxes, across those four themes, what should higher education institutes, whether it's a university or a college or an academy, what are they supposed to do in exactly 12 months' time, right? We are not setting this up as a future-oriented, one day we will get there. We are calling, you know, and if I could, you know, push all of us, uh, I suppose, we need a bias for action, right? And we think, as a starting point, this is the bias for action that all of us need to demonstrate in the next 12 months. On the higher ed side, um, one, can we start thinking about PhD programs for working professionals? NEP already talks about professors of practice. I teach at uh, several business schools in the country. I can tell you it's very heartening for me to see that today there are a lot of people from the industry who are now coming, who do not have a PhD and are now coming to teach at top business schools of the country, right? Um, can we actually do the reverse as well? Can we get working professionals, get a PhD if that is what they are interested in doing? So just the crossover that we spoke about from academia uh, into industry, can we do it the other way around as well? The second thing is, of course, can we align our course offerings uh, with the qualifications framework? Make sure we are establishing equivalence, right? Right now, we have a very rigid way of looking at what a degree is and is supposed to be. Is it, though? I mean, if you think about the morning session, there is nobody who spoke about the importance of degree. And, you know, in, in India, we are very degree obsessed, or we have been. But do we need to be going forward is the question. Uh, from an industry alignment standpoint, again, people like myself, and I'm willing to put my hand up and say um, any university here who would like to partner with me in my personal capacity or with EY Parthenon as their knowledge partner, very happy to do these curriculum audits and say, are you teaching things that will make your students do the right thing, be the right person, have the right skills in the future, right? So everything with respect to curriculum audits, faculty training, secondments, and then of course onboarding professors of practice, which like I said, is, has already begun. We just need a lot more of it. Um, on the research side, again, um, I'm sure 
hand on heart, a lot of academics here would agree that sometimes there is more quantity in our research. We are public publishing, we are ticking the box, but is it necessarily pushing the boundary of knowledge or is it necessarily making a difference to the real world? Hand on heart, I've been a researcher myself, so I can tell you, I think the answer for many of us is no. We have published, we ticked that box, but did it either push the boundary of knowledge or was applicable into the real world? Again, ask yourself that question. Um, inclusivity, again, uh, can we have more leadership um, development programs for female faculty? Can we have a greater representation of different forms of diversity in our uh, faculty and leadership pool and then eventually our student pool? If I look at government, and now I'm speaking to all the government officials present here and people who have influence over policy making, I think uh, the first thing we absolutely need greater policy um, emphasis when it comes to technology. Yes, NEP has said it. Yes, there is 20 to 40 percent of online programs. I think we need to now start thinking how does every college institution in this country actually implement it? Because not everyone will have the same, same wherewithal that our top tier IITs and IIMs, et cetera, do. Uh, industry, government, joint sponsorship programs, so absolutely. I mean, we'll talk about it, I'm pretty sure, in the next panel discussion around SDGs. But how do we make sure that um, whether it's the environment or the social aspect or the governance aspect of ESG, there are the right centers of excellence which are being built in partnership with industry? Uh, of course, and I, I, I love that next one, uh, which is can we have innovation mentors for low tier institutes, right? A lot of the um, colleges and universities present here are all NIRF ranked universities or very close to it, right? What about the vast, vast majority? And again, Mr. Subramaniam gave us the numbers, right? We have roughly 50,000 colleges in this country, 1,100 universities in this country, uh, 12,000 academies and institutes, right? Not everyone has access to innovation mentors. So can government step in here? Just how government is trying to step in into the apprenticeship programs and internship programs. Can the government step in here from an innovation mentor standpoint? And then of course defining uh, comprehensive guidelines um, around inclusivity and diversity. The last one, it's probably me speaking to myself here because I'm probably representing industry and Raghav, people like you are. Can we start to allow our employees the flexibility uh, to pursue PhD programs so that there is the right blend of industry and academia. See, every time we talk about industry academia, we only talk about it from one way, right? We only talk about it as, um, you know, faculty trying to get more guest speakers from the industry. Why do we not talk about it the other way around? I'm pretty sure I know a lot of people who would love to contribute back to higher education as a sector. They just don't know how to. They're just not allowed because they don't have a PhD. Um, of course, work-related learning opportunities. So we, we absolutely, and, and people before me have said this already, that students need the flexibility to go out during their degree program, go out, work in the real world, come back, and that work in the real world is actually uh, contributing to their credit scores, right? And then finally, you know, from a student's, uh, sorry, from an industry standpoint, as I think about research, absolutely, industry needs to do a lot more, so everybody here who is representing uh, corporate, representing industry, please, please, please do not, um, um, you know, sponsor research that only benefits you. Uh, think about you have an opportunity to be nation building here, and therefore you have to partner to make sure you are contributing to research topics that help the country as opposed to only helping the organization. So that's a sneak peek into what the report is and which got launched earlier this morning. Uh, like I said, oh, of course. Yes, please. Absolutely. So that's a great question. And the idea absolutely is, can we have more professors of practice? Now, if universities are open to having professors of practice without a, uh, so sorry, I can repeat his question. He's saying if we are talking about the lack of relevance or the inadequacy of relevance of degrees going forward, why are we talking about PhD programs? Absolutely, sir, it's a, it's a great point. The idea is if universities are comfortable in not having PhD 
professors, but people who are professors of practice, absolutely it's not required. But historically, and um, you know, again, I, I only can speak from a business school standpoint, there has been that bias. We will only take you on as a professor if you have a PhD. Till that bias continues, can we create um, you know, more accessible PhD programs for people in the industry? Sorry, General Venkatesh. Uh, let me tell you uh, that the recent policy of UGC permits universities to take process of practice without PhD with a relevant industry experience. But I find it a little problematic as a vice chancellor mm -hmm. in the sense that universities cannot afford the salaries that an industry provides to these professors of practice. Yeah. This is where I feel there is a relevance to industry academia collaborations. I would yeah. want industry consortia yeah. to perhaps lend them to the university for a period of time while taking part of the salary, university will pay the university salary, whereas the industry should be able to take on the salary component, which is not available. With Absolutely. The Great point. This Great is, point. all of us do feel it, and we are welcoming industry professors of practice coming and teaching. Yeah. We are benefiting. We do have some of them. Yeah. But the policy does not, uh, you know, it is permissible It doesn't now. forbid anymore. It Absolutely. is not. And like I said, I mean, even when I teach uh, General Venkatesh, I've, I've, I've now started seeing in the IAMs a lot of professors of practice. So it's happening, but is, is it happening across the board is the question, right? But I agree with you, um, the salary differential is definitely a cause of concern. Good, I think the fact that you are here, it means that I'm out of time. Uh, can we, uh, do we have? Sorry, we can have questions during the panel discussion. So thank you so much, everyone. Any questions on the report or otherwise, very happy to talk to you outside as well. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Vantika. I request you to join the panel as I also invite our eminent panelist of the next session to kindly join us up on the stage. I invite Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, Vice Chancellor, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome sir. I would like to invite Dr. Dev Swaroop, Vice Chancellor, Baba Amte, Devyang University. A very warm welcome to you, sir. I invite the Honorable Mr. Will Hodgman. He's Adjunct Professor, College of Arts, Law and Education, University of Tasmania. A very warm welcome. Inviting Mr. Raghav Gupta. MD India and Asia Pacific, Coursera. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And Ms. Nupur Junjunwala, trustee and co-founder, Change Inc. And ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished moderator for this session is Mr. Anand Sudarshan, founder and director, Silent Advisors Private Limited. A very warm welcome to you, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, this session will underscore the vital role universities play in driving the positive change and progress towards SDGs on a global scale. And essential partners in the pursuit of UN SDGs, universities lead with innovative research, empower students to address pressing challenges and collaborate with 18th Fiki Higher Education Summit, diverse stakeholders to create impactful solutions. HEIs act as catalysts for transformation and play a pivotal role in addressing social, economic, and environment issues on a global scale and shaping a better future for all. With those words, I would like to hand over to our distinguished chairperson, over to you, sir. And may I remind you, you have one hour for the session. Thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here amidst all of you uh, once again. And uh, I look forward to satisfying your hunger to understand all about SDGs today before you are joined for your physical hunger of uh, and sated through lunch. We have a wonderful panel here today uh, and we have Avantika join the panel as well. So the, the format that we're going to have is a very simple one. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to request each of the panelists, except Vantika, so you take your initial thing as something that's been done. So we will have, I'm going to request each of the panelists to spend about four minutes, uh, you know, given the lack of time now, um, we'll have four minutes um, uh, to, for their initial remarks. And uh, I'm going to introduce the subject for two or three minutes. And then after that, we will get into a 
and interactive engagement. I have a few questions, uh, two or three of which I will cover as I give the introduction, and then we'll take it on from there. Is that fine with everybody? Yeah? And I will also, of course, play the role of the bad boy. As, I as I've been telling them, I will interrupt them. So we are all from academia, you know, we speak for a long time. And uh, we have to make sure there's a bell rings at the end of the period, so I, I will be that bell. And I will interrupt, and I have the permission to do so, so I apologize for the rudeness which you may see. Uh, but I do that with their kind permission. Um, the subject that's been given to us today is uh, uh, to essentially discuss about uh, um, uh, advancing the global agenda, universities as key partners in as achieving sustainable development goals. How many of us here are aware of SDGs, what the SDGs are? Okay. So what I'll do is, I think only a few hands that I see, I'm going to spend just a minute or so very quickly talking about SDGs. Now, uh, Millennium Development Goals were a very successful initiative of the United Nations. Um, eight goals were set, uh, which included the eradication of extreme poverty, there was a special focus on AIDS, HIV, and so on and so forth. I have read a lot of reports and data relating to how successful MDGs were, while I haven't really found any report which establishes correlation and causation you know, ex explicitly, separately. I do have uh, a lot of evidence that I have read that the MDGs have been very effective, at least a few of them have been extremely effective. So in 2015, 193 countries came together and then set the next set of goals, given the success of MDGs, and these are called Sustainable Development Goals, and there are 17 of them, and uh, they cover a wide range of subjects. I'm not going to go through all of them, but that includes no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, um, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industrial innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions. These 16 are specific topics. And the 17th one is one key method uh, which is required to link all of this up together, which talks about partnerships for the goals. I'm going to, I'm emphasizing that because that's going to be a key component of our conversation today, I hope. So these are the SDGs, and uh, I would urge each of you, when you get the chance, if any of you wants the little booklet, United Nations, you can find it on the net very easily. UN publishes these little booklets, uh, you know, 30 page, 20, 15, 20 pages, which talks about each of the SDGs and the goals against that. And one of the goals which specifically mentions higher education actually talks about uh, access for disadvantaged sections of society across the world for higher education. So that's a direct impact, but there is a story which is far beyond that for higher education. I would urge you to read it. And uh, once you listen to the you know, panelists today and the, uh, and the engagement that hopefully will be able to leave some thoughts behind with you, you will understand how important it is. India as a nation, uh, our governments, whatever the uh, party in power, are totally committed to SDGs and there is a lot of initiatives that have been going on behind that as well. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. So that's SDG, and you know what we will now do is to go around the table um, and uh, have the initial remarks of about four, four minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, General Venkatesh, and then I'm going to follow that up with uh, Professor Swaroop, where are you there, sir? So yours going to be after that, so be prepared. And then I will you know, take on from there, one after the other. General Venkatesh, all yours. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you, Fiki, for uh, giving this opportunity. Greetings to all of you from Manipal Academy of Higher Education and Institution of Eminence deemed to be university. I'm very happy to be participating in this panel discussion because uh, sustainable development goal is for the entire world. And literally, it is an endorsement of these goals by the literally every country in the world in the UN that we need to achieve them by 2020. Uh, 2030 to bring in equity, justice, you know, uh, reasonable uh, levels of comfort to the every citizen of the world. And um, Mahe, as a as a university, uh, the entire edifice was built on societal commitment. When our founder thought that it is important for us to eradicate illiteracy, ill health, and poverty, much before in 30s, in 40s, he thought about this and started 
schools, colleges, hospitals, community engagements, empowering women, encouraging, you know, microfinance, you know. In, uh, as early as uh, in 30s, he started the syndicate bank and allowing rural women to save 25 paisa, 50 paisa for their rainy day. So uh, it, uh, it is very important for us that we continue with our uh, journey in the, on the foundation laid by our founder. And keeping that in mind, uh, I'm very clear that we are very clear at our uh, university that it is very, very important for everyone involved that we strive towards achieving the sustainable development goals. How do we do it? You know, as a university, all of us are aware that it is a microcosm of the entire university. Everything is represented there, diversity, uh, poverty, uh, you know, uh, the need for uh, support, and more than anything else, the requirement to engage with the society. So as a university, you need to address all these 16 sustainable development goals and one, and in all our activities, we are, you know, without even knowing that we are engaging and doing things which relate to this, these uh, sustainable development goals. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the university to shape the future leaders and thinkers who are our students that, and other stakeholders within the university that they think like that, align themselves to sustainable development goals when they move out of the university. It's not about sensitizing them. It is about internalizing sustainable development goals in anybody and everybody who in the university. Therefore, there are a lot of things that needs to be done that is, uh, you know, bringing in sustainable development goals in our, in our curriculum, bringing in sustainable development goals in our, in our uh, research, bringing in sustainable development goals in the way we engage with the society, bringing in sustainable development goals in the collaborations with the industry, with the governmental, non-governmental organization, more than anything else, you know, record all that we are doing. If you look at it, you know, Dr. Vidya was um, in the morning mentioned about, you know, why we are giving so much importance to ranking and rating. To a small extent, I would say that the ranking and rating also endorse your commitment to sustainable development goals, whether it be Times Higher Education or QS or even the NARF. That means the inclusivity is a big factor. You know, the scholarship that you are providing is another factor which assesses. And the research and linking research to sustainable development goals is another major factor. Just to give a small example, what we started three years ago, I told my researchers that every paper that you publish, try and, you know, link it to our sustainable development goals. I'm very happy to state that, you know, last year we published around 4,000 papers out of which almost 35% of them today have been linked to a sustainable development goal. And we are taking this target to 50%, by, uh, 75% by 2025. That's what I mean to say that every research that happens in the university can have a reference and a relevance to sustainable development goals. Other important thing that we are looking at is about the engaging students. I think as a university, we've always engaged students in social work. I'm very happy to state that at Mahe, we have perhaps the largest student voluntary service organization in the country. We have close to 13,000 students who engage in volunteerism every week, every Sunday. And all these students are, you know, totally committed to the, the com community that we are engaging in, adopting villages, spreading education in, in the underprivileged people, providing them with food and support, providing them with clean energy, clean water. And as a university, I think there's more to it that we need to, you know, uh, uh, commit ourselves to sustainable development goals in terms of building our own community, building sustainable buildings, using clean energy, having research going towards producing you know, uh, renewable energy, use of renewable energy as a major source of energy, water conservation, water recharging, beach cleaning, you link anything and everything, an activity that happens in the university will have a reference and a relevance to sustainable development goals. So keeping this in mind, it's also important that you speak about your this thing. We have a very specific website in Mahe, sustainability.org manipal.edu, which literally reflects every sustainable development goal activity that we conduct. And also, these days now, sustainability rankings have come up. Times Higher Education has come out with a, you know, impact ranking on sustainability. 
And uh, this is most, in many universities are taking part. I'm very happy to state at Mahe, a point that uh, the earlier speaker mentioned about equity. We are ranked number four in gender equity in the global, at the global level, and 25 in quality of education. Therefore, what we do should reflect on the outcomes too, and more than anything else, it is the administrative commitment towards sustaining, developing, and taking sustainable development goals as a core area of universal function that should engage all the students and stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thanks, General Venkatesh, and once again, I apologize that uh, I'm kind of speeding things up, but we really don't have much of a choice. But two things that you said uh, stood out for me. One, you said that the responsibility of universities is to sh shape future leaders. You know, I I'm going to touch upon that later as we have a conversation. And the second thing we talked about is uh, bringing in an SDG orientation in many things or pretty much everything that a university does. And you listed a few. And you also made another observation, which I'm going to talk about, that universities are doing a lot of work, Mahe does, for example, but uh, connected to SDG, but may, most of which may be happening inadvertently or without you recognizing that it's happening. We'll come back to that as well as we go along. Uh, Professor Swaroop. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Dev Swaroop. I worked in UGC, and then I'm Vice Chancellor of Baba Amti Divyang University, Jaipur. So while talking about uh, sustainability, we cannot undermine the importance of the subject. As we know, the goals already stated. But the role played by universities in India is something very, very important. I worked in a public funded institution. And as you know, the growth of the private universities in the last one or one and a half decade. So this is something which is uh, to be taken into consideration with that kind of perspective. When we talk about relevance of the SDGs, we cannot undermine. The role played by universities is also equally important, but its operational mechanism uh, is, is, is little different in public funded universities and private universities. In public funded universities, it is difficult to go for changes. You know, it's not easy. But in private universities, you can go for the changes. You can revise or devise your curriculum very frequently. Now, it's happening in uh, public funded universities also. So there is a need to identify the goals which are already there, then to devise a strategy which can be common for both. But as uh, the earlier panelists, you know, in the UGC, we used to talk about access, equity, quality, and relevance. But in the morning, there was a talk about employability only. So when we talk about education for employability, then the context is, is changed completely. But when we talk about SDGs, this is something socially relevant subject. And educational institutions are the places where we create a citizenry. Okay? So, uh, and conventionally, the universities were uh, teaching institutions in our country. So while suggesting few things that it is necessary that the university should have a separate cells. You know, in the universities now we have IQACs, internal quality assurance cells. Earlier there were no IQACs. Similarly, we can have these cells uh, dedicated for SDGs. And for each goal, we can have uh, a specifically identified person to, to supervise that particular uh, uh, activities with related to that goal. And similarly, uh, we can have, uh, we can associate these, the activities and the performance and the, uh, the, the, the contribution made by the institutions in terms of uh, its recognition and recognition uh, in, uh, in context of the rankings also. We have our NRF ranking, we have the uh, uh, NAC accreditation, so we can uh, incorporate, we can give some recognition, some weightage to these, uh, uh, you know, contributions. And uh, we can have, you know, substantial funding also. It's, it's very, very difficult to say about big changes. Private sector can do, but in public funded institutions, the institutions are really uh, struggling for uh, its basic uh, requirements. So to, to, uh, to do something additional, you need some uh, funding also. In, in CSR also, it can be, uh, you know, uh, in, incorporated. And the government should also take 
all these uh, considerations into uh, into account while formulating the policies and and in in whole, in, a, in in totality if we say that yes uh, we can uh, you know always there is a possibility we are still in a evolving there was a time when we talk about uh, GER, it was 10%. Vidya used to come to UGC, it was 10%. Then in last 10, 15 years, um, the, the, the increase of the universities, now 43,000, 44,000 colleges uh, are there, and uh, 1,100 universities, so this increase. But now the quality is a very, very important issue. The employability is very, very important issue. But simultaneously, it is very important for our academic institutions. I am a vice chancellor of a Divyang University. So inclusivity is a big issue. We are working on that. Similarly, I am additionally holding the charge of Skills University. So in the Skills University also, we are keeping into consider already a lot of activities are going on uh, on these, uh, uh, towards the achieving these goals, but not in a professional manner, not in a very uh, specifically, uh, uh, you know, uh, disciplined manner. So there is a need to, to have a specific strategy, a specific action plan for each goal, and the universities are the best place can contribute for improvement and uh, uh, achieving uh, a lot of uh, you know, progress in uh, respective areas. So this is my submission that the universities can certainly play a role, pivotal role, and for that, there is a need to have a proper strategy, action plan, and for each group, there is a need to have a specific cell, and there is a need to have the ranking uh, uh, agencies and the government to consider the contribution made by these institutions for some reward to the institution. So uh, with this, I, would, uh, I will say that, yes, we are very much hopeful. But uh, there is a need, because at the last, uh, if you see the 17 goals, the last is partnership. Partnership is very, very important. Because no goal is separate. They are all interrelated. So the educational institution is also the part of the society. You know, uh, the youth uh, is... Professor Roop. Youth, yes, sir. Here so with this, time. I will uh, sum up. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Appreciate it, sir. So, you know, what I picked up from what you said is, you know, you talked about it is tougher maybe with public universities. Yes. But the situation is changing. And just like private universities, Allocation of funds and the flexibility, nimbleness, agility is possible. Okay. Sir, one second. Just competitiveness. You may have seen that this knack has become, all of a sudden, have become very, very important. Mm -hmm. NRF ranking has also become very, very important. So the state governments and the chancellors of these public funded universities are also pressing for uh, uh, rankings, the, the accreditation. So they are also progressing well. So okay. progress is there. Very good. So you also talked about... Um, you know, you re-emphasize the point that General Venkatesh made that education creates citizens, and I think that's a very important point. Uh, two ideas that you gave, one uh, was relating to creating dedicated cells for each of the SDGs, uh, uh, headed by perhaps a faculty member or a cell that gets created. Um, and then you also said that the NIRF or NAC or any of these accreditation slash ranking systems should include the impact that the university has made on specific SDG goals, either directly or indirectly. I'm adding some words to what you said, but either directly or indirectly uh, to um, uh, in, 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 in making their assessments. And I think that's uh, another point to be kept in mind. We'll come back more. So we've listened to two vice chancellors. I'm going to you know move uh, across the ocean, so to speak, and uh, request uh, Honorable Professor Hodgman to share your initial thoughts, uh, given your wide uh, and fairly spectacular, you know, diversity of experience, uh, you can give us a, a viewpoint. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. I might just take a minute uh, or two to introduce myself and where I'm from, because I think it's very pertinent uh, to the nature of our discussions um, today. I've come all the way from Tasmania uh, to be with you today, um, Australia's southernmost state. It's the last stop before Antarctica. Um, it is also Australia's natural state. Uh, around 50% of the island and its wilderness areas are preserved in national parks or World Heritage listed. 
Uh, we breathe the cleanest air in the world for any populated place. Uh, we are 100% renewable energy generated and the surplus electricity that we make we can export into Australia's national electricity uh, market. Um, and we are a place that has very strong environmental attributes that are embedded in our citizens, in our governments um, and in our institutions. Um, and it's a, a place that has uh, an enormous ability to project to the rest of the world how partnerships between uh, these entities can deliver real change as we seek to address um, our climate and sustainability challenges. Uh, I'm not an academic. In fact, I'm now a, an enterprise professor working for the University of Tasmania, uh, where I studied a law and arts degree back in the last century. But in between now and then, um, I served as Tasmania's Premier or Chief Minister, during which time Tasmania became one of the first jurisdictions in the world to be zero net emissions. And it didn't happen by chance. We have natural advantages, but we needed to invest and commit our community broadly to achieving that. Um, since then, I've worked as Australia's Ambassador or High Commissioner to Singapore, during which time we struck what is the world's first green economy agreement between two nations. Um, and it will be very ambitious, it is very ambitious and bold in its um, endeavours and its ambitions. But it will also be a pathfinder for other nations, I suspect potentially Australia and India, and indeed on a regional context. It will deliver enormous global benefit. And as I say, now working for the University of Tasmania, which itself is a global leader. It has achieved number one ranking in the world for two years in a row uh, in the Times Education, uh, higher education rankings for addressing climate change, for taking action that deals not only uh, with its teaching and its research, but also how it conducts its own affairs in a sustainable way. So Tasmania and its university are leading the world. In fact, we're fifth overall across all those sustainability goals. Um, and we're ranked up against 1,500 of the world's universities. Um, it also embeds, as our community does, through its research, through its teaching, through its engagement with government, um, sustainability. Uh, there are enormous advantages for students who are learning in Tasmania uh, through courses. There are enormous opportunities through researchers that are world leaders in areas where Tasmania stands apart in Antarctic and Southern Oceans research, in uh, forestry and agriculture, in mining and resource management, but also in inclusivity and access to education. They're especially important to our university. Um, and this is a university that not only um, has a strong record uh, domestically, but is, has a strong outreach. Um, and I'm here with a delegation now looking to build partnerships in India because I've learned from my experience across all levels of government in Australia and now working for this institution that the best way to deliver positive outcomes are through partnerships. A vision, a commitment and the infrastructure needed to drive those forward. It is not only a hallmark of my experiences in those roles but it's also been the key to our success in achieving what is only a very, very small snapshot uh, of some of Tasmania's remarkable achievements uh, from the other end of the world. I'm delighted to have travelled here to be part of this today. I uh, look forward to our, our discussions now, but also beyond this. Um, as I say, Tasmania's university is now here in India looking to build new partnerships. So we hope from this some may come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It must be quite a journey travelling from a place which has got the cleanest air in the world to I won't say anything more because I should not disrespect Delhi. <laughs> uh, thank you. A couple of things I picked up from what you said. You talked about, uh, of course, your experience has uh, demonstrated this uh, in real terms. So that's an example that you gave of the agreement that you signed uh, between Singapore and Australia, uh, that you were instrumental in getting it signed. Uh, so a concerted action between governments, universities, and society actually works. 
And I think that's a, that's a key point that uh, I wanted to pick up. And we also, and I, I, I'm, I'm making an extension to that, which is uh, uh, responsible and sensible regulation, you know, which takes into account whatever are the economic uh, growth parameters that are required for that, you know, country will also be, uh, are, are, is also very essential in creating a framework for uh, any, especially on areas relating to uh, sustainability on the SDG side that, that needs to be done. I picked that up as what, uh, something that you said. And uh, the other point that you made, which is very important, which, is, which contrasts to what General Venkatesh said in terms of its implementation, which he said that you should have explicit goals and explicit engagement with the government and also allow for students studying in University of Tasmania in this case to study subjects that are the area in areas that are directly connected with the SDG, which will be a larger contributor as a whole. And, and I think it's a very interesting thing. It's also uh, perhaps something to do with the fact that, you know, India and Tasmania are probably in, in a, you know, uh, slightly different uh, scenarios in, in many respects, but it's a lesson that uh, can be picked up and learned. So we, we, lear we heard from, um, uh, from the universities and uh, uh, I, I just want to shift gears a little bit and really listen to two other people. They'll, they'll uh, uh, start with Raghav, um, which is to give a perspective uh, both from a technology and an institutional perspective. And I'm starting with you because, and then I'm going to come to uh, you last, because it's a, you're going to present an individual's perspective. You know, so far, including Raghav, to some extent, it's going to be institutional perspective. And I'm going to ask you to focus on the individual when we come to you, Raghav. Thank you. Um, so as we talk about SDGs, you know, I was thinking back uh, March 2008, my family and I had come back from overseas after living overseas for two years. And we had missed uh, two Diwalis because we were in Europe and we were really looking forward to Diwali, which happens obviously in October, November. And throughout childhood, I'd always burst lots of firecrackers. And I have two kids and they were early school, right? And they went, they went to Shriram school in Gurgaon and when Diwali came, I said, guys, let's go and buy firecrackers. And as many schools do today, and that school did a wonderful job, the children were up in arms. They were like, you cannot buy firecrackers. And since then, I don't think my family and I have burst firecrackers. And I think in general, we've always thought about how do you think about responsible consumption in simple ways, simple practical ways. And as I was thinking about this panel yesterday, I said, look, uh, education has a massive role when we come to think about the broader thing about SDGs. And it might not be just a, a commercial role, but this is the fiduciary duty of higher education. It's the duty of doing good of higher education. Because if children can be impacted in such, such a way, and obviously not enough has happened, we all know the pollution story in Delhi, but if some children can be impacted through education, where they become lifelong citizens of responsible com uh, con consumption of climate change, pollution, and so on, then higher education has a massive uh, role to play. That was one point I wanted to start with. The second point, and we've heard this theme through the morning, that industry academia collaboration and the general sentiment there is that academia is lagging industry when it comes to skills, when it comes to employability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's think about what industry is doing from an SDG standpoint. And maybe this is uh, interesting to many of you. So in my role as uh, MD of Coursera, I meet hundreds of CXOs in India and parts of Asia. And I meet CHROs and I meet CEOs and I meet chief digital officers. So far in the last six years, I have met one chief sustainability officer. This gentleman was in Singapore. And this gentleman was European, he was not Asian. So I have met one chief sustainability officer. And when I talk to companies and see what they're doing, are you building skills to drive SDGs? Are you building skills to drive green economy? Are you building enough skills around climate change, etc.? Reality is not enough is being done by industry today when it comes to SDGs, unless you are forced to do it. You have CSR budgets in India, you have to contribute, you're forced to do it, you do something about it. Indian Stock Exchange, Malaysian Stock Exchange is asking companies to report what are your SDG uh, initiatives, so companies are being forced to do something about it. And I'm not talking about the large business houses, the Tatas and the Birlas and so on, who are in a different league. But here is an opportunity for actually academia to take leadership 
and I go back to my example of Diwali firecrackers, that from your duty of fiduciary good for society, from your duty of doing what's good for society, is there an opportunity to take a leadership role here? And I really think there is. And even influence industry and take a leadership role here, per se. Thank you, Raga. Very interesting. Two points I picked up from what you said is, uh, uh, I like the phrase that you used, fiduciary duty of higher education. I think it's a, it's a very powerful phrase. Um, you know, uh, I think it's in, fiduciary is, of course, a very specific word, but in the context of where we are today, we have to think of it as deeply as that. That's something that is, uh, uh, it's a moral imperative, you know. I don't want to get into morals too much, but I think it is a moral imperative for each of the institutions to take SDG seriously. And I, the example that you gave highlighted that also. Uh, the second example that I gave, which I picked up from you, is, um, you know, industry is really not doing as much with SDGs as they probably ought to. And the only area, perhaps, with most uh, enterprises that they are doing is maybe relating to that part of ESG. And that is also only because there is what I would call as enlightened coercion from regulatory authorities, which basically tonk them on the head if they don't uh, provide the ESG report. And if they don't uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, uh, sufficient amount of attention to ESG, and I think that that uh, enlightened coercion is going to increase, and which is a good thing. You know, thank you. And I'm going to finally come to you, no uh, um Your your background and experience in terms of uh, dealing with the differences, and then bringing the or taking the differences off the table and bringing everybody to mainstream. It's actually fascinating. If you can spend 30 seconds introducing you and what you do to the audience, that would be good. And then add your comments, you have four minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. So I'm, a, I'm the founder of an organization called Change Inc. We work on mainstreaming people with disabilities and tapping into their untapped potential. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about exactly what we're discussing in terms of, but we have an inclusion lens. Um, the world has been focusing on inclusion of people with different genders, and it's time that we start looking at people with disabilities. This is at the core of one of the vulnerable groups that the SDGs also acknowledges and talks about across all 17, disability, uh, 17 SDGs. Having said that, people with disabilities are more vulnerable to being uneducated, unemployed, um, at risk for violence, and um, what this translates into, today a child who does is unable to go to school and get an education because of his or her disability is tomorrow's adult who is unemployed and a recipient, hopefully a recipient of social uh, benefits uh, or social welfare. Now, what does that lead to as, as an economic value? We have more research coming out which says in low and median income countries, this can create a three to seven percent loss in GDP. Three to seven percent loss in GDP because a child with a disability isn't able to go to school. This is not a small number considering that there are billion people in the world with a disability. This number is growing because disabilities are not only what you're born with, it's progressive. Now I'll give you a flip side and that's where our organization comes in. If you look at the group of neurodiverse disabilities, there is recent research, in fact, by EY, that showcases that if you include people with neurodiversity, conditions like autism, learning disabilities, it can increase GDP by 1.2%. So one case is you have a loss in GDP, social welfare burden, healthcare burden, and on the other end, you have an opportunity loss because you're not tapping into their potential. 40% of the world's self-made billionaires are dis have a learning disability. In 2020, the top 10 companies that were founded by somebody with a learning disability like dyslexia contributed $1 trillion to the global economy. $1 trillion, that means one of us is employed or impacted by this company. And this was a recessionary year. Now, if I put this in context of higher education, SDG 4, which is on education, has an indicator to ensure that this vulnerable groups, whether they are disabled, gender, 
EWS, indigenous, and other vulnerable groups are enrolled into higher education. But more importantly, let's think about why do the disadvantaged or the vulnerable not get an education? Accessibility, so you will know ramps, adaptive technologies, all of this. Who innovates this? Where does the innovation for solutioning for SDG challenges come from? And that's where your higher education institutions play a very, very critical role. And we actually have a very successful model, historically, which sort of talks about what I have just um, theoretically explained. I'm sure everybody here knows Professor Negroponte from MIT. He's the founder of Media Labs, MIT Media Labs. He's also dyslexic. He has a learning disability. He's the father of um, technologies like you know, GPS and things like that that we, don't, we can't live without. Uh, God forbid I had to go somewhere without Google Maps. I'd never reach there, thanks to GPS technology. But jokes apart, in 2005, Professor Negroponte at Davos stood up and said, we need one laptop per child. You cannot have shared technology for education anymore if we want to bridge the digital and the educational gaps in the world. This was contrary to everything that was being spoken about in terms of digital divide meeting educational goals at that point. He stood there, he wrote, he, he mobilized the industry to say, you know, one of the biggest barriers of achieving this target is getting low screen devices, cheap touch screen devices. Guess what happened? We're 20 years later, we have a smartphone which is under $100, as good as the most powerful laptop at that point, probably better. Who initiated that? It was initiated in the labs of MIT, chaperoned by and sort of, uh, I would say, really, really championed by a professor with a vision, who in fact is also the director of DIC, which today is creating all of our global stack uh, projects, and I know I'm out of time. So I think a lot of this has already been touched upon, but there are three things that maybe we can think about. One is how do higher educational institutions ensure diversity and enable the vulnerable to actually be part of the community to meet the SDG target of uh, you know, SDG 4? Second is how do we become enablers to actually solution cross uh, SDG challenges? So whether that is disciplinary, whether that's research, whether that's joint innovation, that bit. And the third bit is how do we revive our higher education institutions to become the areas of innovation and thought leadership, which starts looking at these problem statements in a way that shifts not just you know, what we're thinking we need to achieve, but how we will achieve it over the next decade. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Um, Kudos to the kind of work that you're doing, honestly, uh, knowing the subject of dyslexia and Downs a little bit, it's uh, spectacular, uh, for more power to you. Uh, what I picked up from you is uh, you talked about define inclusivity from a perspective of neurodiversity, and I think that's a key point. And that's something I think the, your report talks about physical disability, but I did not hear neuro disabilities, and maybe that's something you may want to consider. Maybe it's there in the report, but at least in the, the summary it is not there. So anyway, just an observation I wanted to make. The other thing that you talked about is shifting perspective by absorbing and, and adopting, adapting, focus on SDG. You believe that leadership can be demonstrated by shifting perspectives. Very important point, and we'll keep that in front of the mind. As we shift now to a conversation between the panelists, and if I have time, I would like to come back to the audience uh, for a few questions at least, but let's try and do our best. I'm going to start with you, Avantika. You know. And the question is, uh, uh, which Vicky had actually given as a part of the briefing is, um, how can universities effectively align all what they do, teaching, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, what they do to SDGs, select or collective SDGs? And more importantly, in your experience in conversations with uh, institutions across board in India, have you observed, uh, even if they have not mentioned it explicitly, have you observed any innovative approaches that they have taken? Uh, one example I'll give you straight up front is I know personally what Mahe, Mahe did from yeah. a green campus perspective, and I know there are others as well. Yeah. Uh, but I just want you, I, I'm giving that as a kind of a 
little this thing kick off for me. you for yes, yeah for uh, kind of stuff that you have to focus on. No, sure. Thanks so much for that, Anand, um, and thank you all panelists for those. Uh, very, very enriching remarks. So uh, let me answer, your, you've asked me two questions. One is, um, you know, what can universities do? And then in my work as EY Parthenon, have we come across universities doing some great job? Um, so let me start with the first. So I think what can universities do? And again, for all the academics in the room, I think the first thing is there are 17 SDGs, right? You don't have to champion all of them in one go. Right. Um, University of Tasmania, the delegates are here, uh, Professor spoke about it as well. Start with, um, you know, a theme, a topic, a subject that is closest to what the university is, what it stands for, right? Start with something. And, and that starting point, according to me, can be as simple as update your curriculum, right? Can the curriculum reflect, and going back to the very simple example that Raghav gave, right? The school that his kids went to taught the power of not bursting firecrackers and therefore the impact that it would have on the environment, right? Something as basic, as simple as that. Why can we not, in our universities, update our curriculum, perhaps not reflect all 17 SDGs just yet, right? Because it seems like a daunting task. Start by incorporating some of the themes from SDGs into the curriculum, irrespective of what course is being taught. On that front, I mean, I would call out, there are universities at the moment, um, Anand. Um, there's definitely IIIT Delhi. There is IIT Kanpur. There is IIT Bombay. There is Ashoka University. A lot of these have started incorporating either very, very um, uh, overtly, explicitly, calling it out in the curriculum itself, or hosting events that are making sure that even though the curriculum is there, uh, perhaps a little bit more traditional, there is a parallel track running to it, which is SDGs, right? Mm -hmm. So that is one example of just purely curriculum. I'll give two quick ones before I pass on. One, uh, just on the interdisciplinary research, right? So multidisciplinarity of research is something that I don't think in this country, at least, we've started doing a lot of. Every time we are doing research, we are purely focused on our subject, our core area, our theme, our topic. Can we not collaborate, not just with other academics, but also with um, industry as well as government bodies to bring that uh, multidisciplinarity of research, right? And the last one, I think you've already uh, quite rightly said it, is around the physical aspect of um, SDGs and, and ESG, therefore, uh, with green campuses, with zero waste management programs, et cetera, et cetera, which is a more infrastructural aspect as opposed to necessarily a knowledge or a curriculum aspect. Thank you. I was actually hoping that you would say that. I think it is much easier to focus on the infrastructural aspects because it is a, you know, a VC decision, a board decision that gets implemented through uh, perhaps the academic, uh, you know, uh, side of the university. And it's a far harder thing to do uh, to, um, to infuse SDG or goals, specific goals in SDG as a part of the DNA of the university. I'm going to ask this, this continuing this question both to uh, General, uh, General Venkatesh and to Professor Saruk. Why is it so, I mean, is it very difficult for university to do what we just now spoke about, what Avantika uh, mentioned and what I added on? Is it difficult to do? And is it possible to do at all? I mean, you have all kinds of problems, right? First of all, you have to, uh, you know, you have what? 10, 11,000 students joining you every year, um, um, all kinds of problems. There are students who have to be taken care of. There are re regulations to be met, and all these pesky regulators keep coming, and uh, then you have to submit data to 25 different places for your accreditation. I mean, life is tough, you know, as a university when you're running. And then you're telling me, uh, Anand, please uh, look at SDGs and add-on. I mean, is that is that possible at all? Is that making sense at all? The question is to both of you, Vice Chancellors. I'll make a couple of points. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just make a couple of points on uh, what you mentioned. I would, uh, as a Vice Chancellor, I'll say it's not difficult. It needs your, you know, you need a commitment. As I mentioned it earlier. And what uh, Ms. Avantika mentioned about some of the universities are doing, many universities are doing without actually overtly saying that these are linked with SDGs. But uh, I can only speak for my university. 
uh, this uh, point about uh, linking uh, the uh, curriculum to SDGs is happening. No, not at the scale that it should happen, but it is happening. And this awareness is coming, that sensitization is there, that internalization is there. I'm sure this is going to be uh, a fast track over the next couple of years or three years or five years. That is something which is happening. And very specific to certain SDGs, there are courses which are built around it. Some of them formal graded courses, some of them informal courses. The second point that all of us can definitely do is in every university activity, be it be a symposium, be it be a conference, be it be a guest lecture, if we can start linking it to an SDG, that itself is a, is a major, major effort and that brings in a lot more awareness among students, amongst faculty. I have made it mandatory in the university that in my presentation, whenever I put a slide, I link it to a certain SDG. This is leading by, you know, by example. I know that it takes a lot of time. These changes will reflect over a period of time. But more you speak, more you reinforce. More you show, more you reinforce. This is something that we need to do. Second point uh, you spoke about is about multidisciplinary research. Very critical. And uh, again, it is happening. At Mahe, I can mention we have more than 140 research centers which are focusing on diverse areas. I have made an effort, or we have made an effort, to ensure that each of these centers, the work that they're doing, be it be in capacity building or research or in collaboration, link it to overlapping SDGs. That is how perhaps you can take this forward. And that is the reason why I said, if there is a commitment, there's always you can do something. And uh, most of it will happen automatically once there is internalization. That means everybody in the university must think about it. An SDG when they're doing a certain task. And it is easier to do it with the younger population. I'm telling you, students will absorb it very fast, and they will reflect it very fast. And the enthusiasm with which they work is something amazing. Thank you. I think that's one takeaway for uh, um, uh, institutions who are here, which is, you know, make it as a part of your conversation. Make it as a part of your conversation in such a way that there is no choice but for everybody to participate in the conversation with that as a semi-anchor point. And I think that will start uh, bringing in the change and the rest of it. You heard him speak. Professor Roo. Very briefly. Yeah. Very briefly, I would like to submit that nothing is impossible. He has rightly said that it's very much possible. This is the issue of uh, mindset and the attitude, number one. Number two, already in, the, in our universities, uh, lots of activities are being uh, taking place through NSS. Now I'm visiting the universities. Many universities have solar panels to meet their energy requirements, rainwater harvesting. But yes, as I feel that there is a need to be more professional with regard to achieving these goals. So there is a need to have a proper strategy, proper planning and awareness in the campus uh, uh, among the students. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sure that uh, it is already happening and it can be uh, undertaken in a more professional manner without uh, any doubt. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Raghav, you wanted to add to this. Yeah, so just on the point of uh, making this uh, a must have and not a good to have, uh, I think students who are the primary st stakeholders for many institutions uh, will possibly take on SDG related skilling and knowledge if one of two things happens. Either this needs to become a part of curricula or this needs to enable them to bring, uh, get into certain careers specifically. Now, it's early days, but there are certain careers that are coming up which are relevant in terms of SDGs and ESGs and so on. As an example, uh, companies like LNT, Adani, etc., are saying instead of hiring construction managers, we will hire green construction managers. Now, what are the skills along with the civil engineering skill that you bring to the table, which are green related skills? And have you learned that as a part of your institution? And similarly, companies like Whistle and others are saying, instead of just, just hiring an economist, we will hire an environmental economist. So there are actually emerging opportunities that are coming up. And universities are also saying, look, unless we make it a part of the curricula, students actually learn these subjects and get credits for these subjects, we will not see high level of dissemination and what we've done is we've gone to an Anna University and said, look, many of your students want to go and work in auto sector. 
the most relevant technology for you to be thinking about is electric vehicles. You don't have faculty for electric vehicles. So we'll bring you content from an IIT or we'll bring you content from a Michigan, which can actually enable you to deliver skilling and you know for credit learning on electric vehicles as an example. So if you don't have the faculty, look for that capability. Of course, we are able to support. But there's a lot of good for credit content available to be able to make this a part of curricula as well. So the takeaway is uh, perhaps is that universities can include uh, SDG or the interpretation of an SDG from a curriculum perspective as a part and parcel of the curriculum and perhaps add on some credit. But Raghav, I'm going to push back a little bit if that's okay with you. What percentage of the courses that Coursera offers are directly, indirectly, significantly, indirectly, if indirectly, connected to SDG goals? Do you even measure it at all? Yeah, so <laughs> I have some data points. Uh, it's not very impressive, and this links to what I was saying earlier, that not enough is happening in industry. Uh, Coursera has 130 million learners. 200,000 of them have taken an SDG-related course. So 2 lakh is a large number in absolute terms, but as a percentage of 130 million, it's a small number. Content, there are close to 70 odd courses. The United Nations Secretary General teaches sustainable development for the 21st century on Coursera. So it's a wonderful course to come and take, but should there be more happening both at an industry level and at an academia level, tons to still happen. Fantastic. So what I would recommend is in your conversations with the institutions, and I'm sure you must be having conversations with many of them and having more, uh, you know, perhaps you should highlight the fact that you have uh, some top-notch uh, professors teaching courses and uh, that's something, something that it requests you to. I think you wanted, uh, wanted to add something. Sorry, very, very quickly, quick we're running yeah, out of time. Very quick point. I think, uh, look, more and more students will take those courses if more and more jobs, more and more employers are looking for those skills. Right? I agree I think with there you. has to be a demand and supply. I agree. There all. is a demand component to it that cannot be forgotten and we cannot really discuss it here. That's something that we need to do. No, but last word for you. And then I just want to take maybe two questions from the audience before we have to, you know, close. Yeah. So just to add to Coursera, it's the only online platform that actually has very strong accessibility functionalities yes, for students with disabilities to take the course. Um, what that means is up until school, you can do home education based for people with severe disabilities. But when you go to higher ed, those options don't exist, except if you were to take an IGNU exam which most people with learning disabilities require, but then you require to write out the papers, 100 pages of examination papers and submit it because they don't allow it to be typed. Um, the point being is that, imagine a Professor Stephen Hawking, okay, an Indian version of Professor Stephen Hawking, or imagine an Indian Einstein, do you think he would be at an IIT with our educational system right now? Probably not, right? They, they both have very severe disabilities, did not make it through school, were dropouts, but then found a way to sort of create, like move science forward in ways we can't imagine. Brightest minds, but disabled. Um, platforms like Coursera then provide that bridge. So it's not just about the course. Again, I want to go back to that point, that it's not just about the course and Got what it. you're teaching, but ensuring that the spirit of leaving no one behind of the SDGs responsibly is also kept in mind because those are the solutions that we need. Thank you. Uh, we have time maybe for two questions and strictly just two questions. No comments and big remarks and bhashan, just questions, please. Sorry, being rude again, but really in the interest of time. Uh, can you spot him, somebody? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Introduce yourself and ask the question, please. I will repeat the question. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. The question is, you know, while we are talking about including uh, SDG inclusivity, etc., into the curriculum. We need to, universities also need to focus on the placement of the absorb, uh, absorbing those people with those capabilities, uh, those special people into the industry and that cap, that is probably missing today. Very quickly, Nopur, uh, Professor Swaroop, you first. Very quickly, Divyang. In government setup, you have a reservation for these groups, right? But, but yeah, that is very small. 
but it is certainly a big challenge to absorb them in the industry sector. I think she may suggest something. Please. So I think there's a mind shift change happening where we are seeing industry asking for, for resources who are you know, from, from the marginalized communities, but the pipeline is not available. When you go to campuses and do the recruitment, sure. often you will hear a campus placement person telling a recruiter, yaar, ye to placement, you know, category ka hai, dekh lena, fir baad mein aakar bolna nahi, achha nahi hai resource. And I think that mindset shift needs to sort of change very quickly because think about a person on a wheelchair. They, that doesn't stop them from being the best coder in the world or engineer. Right? And we need to start thinking about based on abilities and the competency required and the skill required to complete a course and do the job versus thinking about all the disabilities and thinking about, oh, I don't have that ramp in my office. That's why if the world's ka best coder, I can't take it away from So I think that bridge, universities, placements, and HRs need to sort of start thinking about together and focusing on competency as well as on skills required to succeed succeed versus the requirement of a disability which may be inhibiting the person in certain aspects of their life thank you thank you i think um, industry is some of the industry has done some good work re relating to physical disability but the others still a long long way to go so you're absolutely right universities will need to work with uh, um, general venkatesh yeah. first and then i'll come back to you and then maybe if there is time we'll take one more question just want to make uh, one comment about um, accessibility and quality education, one of the major SDGs. As a university, we have taken a policy decision that every student of MAHE gets a free Coursera license. That allows them to do their, uh, you know, diverse courses, not necessarily in a narrow field of their own uh, expense. Other thing is even faculty have got access to free licenses, including our online learner. Every single student of MAHE gets an access to a Coursera program, which perhaps encourages and enlarges the scope of asymmetric learning, not necessarily confined to what he is supposed to learn to earn a credit. Uh, this is fantastic, actually. But perhaps as a next step, well, somebody said, what is not measured cannot be managed, and what is not managed cannot be improved. So I guess somewhere along the line. And that's where I think one of the takeaways for FIKI, perhaps, in conversations with the government, with the ranking agencies, is to actually have SDGs as a part of the framework, and I would urge the institutions, uh, whichever the department is actually looking at rankings and submitting data, have parameters in place right now, even though it's not a requirement from NIR or for anybody else, so you can actually start picking up data and collecting and building a bank of data is something that you will require. I want to you wanted to make a point. Yeah, just very quick one. I just wanted to very passionately agree with everything Nupur said, um, and give an example, right, which is, um, it is a cultural shift that is required. To answer, ma'am, your question, it is a mindset shift for sure. In the West, Anand, uh, there are people now who on their LinkedIn profile say, I am dyslexic, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, I know. We in India wouldn't dare to do something like that. Because in our minds, automatically, that means that the employer is going to think there is something wrong with this person, right? This person is neurodiverse, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm not going to hire you. Right? So it absolutely, why is this person in the West doing it? It's because a dyslexic person can think in ways, can imagine things, can be creative in a way that a non-dyslexic mind cannot. So I think it's more, it has to be two-way. People have to come out, share whatever form of disability, whether physical or otherwise. But the people at the receiving end have to stop judging, I suppose, is the simple point I'm making. Yeah, absolutely, it's a great point that you make because as a nation, you know, this is a dichotomy that we are facing. At one level, we celebrate our diversity. We talk about the kind of foods that we have and, and so on and so yeah. Plurality of many things, you know, religion, you know, political parties, everything. You know, we talk about the diversity and plurality, uh, but uh, we fail to reflect that when it comes to individual. I want to come to that lady very quickly. Last question. Yes. Uh, that is the day when God is going to come and bless me. I have no idea. <laughs> and 
No, no, I, I, this is not a question for this uh, panel. Uh, please keep it for, the, there is a se session, I believe, which is going to talk about uh, accreditation and regulation. We'll keep it for that. Till then, you know, uh, we'll do that. Thank you very much, all of you. I believe I have been issued threats that if I don't finish, people are going to kill me because lunch is between <laughs> you and us. So thank you very much. Thank the panelists uh, for sharing your thoughts candidly. Please remember the takeaways. I mean, all of this is of no use if you don't go back, reflect upon it, and hopefully you will implement it. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, sir. May I request our panel to kindly come together for a group photograph? Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, with that, we now break for lunch. The next session commences at 2.15. I would request everyone to kindly be seated back in time for the next session. Lunch is once again served on the first floor. And ladies and gentlemen, may I once again remind about the evening award presentation ceremony, which will commence from 7 p.m. right here in this hall itself. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, we have the B2B meetings and the very important session at 10.30, where Secretary Higher Education Government of India would be addressing the August House. So please enjoy your lunch on the first floor and be back in time for the next session, which commences at 2.15. Thank you. <laughs>